Hello everyone, Dr. Anna Kabeka here with Dr. Alan Christensen. Today we're going to talk on Couch Talk on thyroid health. So introducing my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Alan Christensen, who is an Arizona-based naturopathic physician who helps people overcome adrenal and thyroid disorders and achieving lasting fat loss. He authored the New York Times best-selling book called The Adrenal Reset Diet. He's also the author of The Complete Idiot's Guide to Thyroid Disease. Dr. Christensen is the founding physician behind Integrative Health. His website is drchristensen.com. He's out there in Arizona. And it's an honor to have you here with us today, Alan. Thank you for joining hey. us. <laughs> hey, Anna. I'm totally glad to be here with you. This is going to be a blast. <laughs> I know. I know. Whenever I can get Alan on the phone or in a conversation or on video, it's ideal because he's got the best sense of humor and <laughs> also the best laugh. So hopefully we'll get a lot of that today. So Alan, <laughs> tell us what's going on. You've got this, it's World Thyroid Day and it's a big deal and it's making the news and all of a sudden the, our little thyroid glands getting some big attention. You know, yeah, and it's, I always thought about it as like the Rodney Dangerfield of medicine. You know, it doesn't, doesn't get the respect it deserves. <laughs> you know, people have had an idea that it can be a culprit for stubborn, stubborn weight gain, or it can be like a culprit for fatigue, but the data has gotten stronger that it's a large medical factor. You know, we, there's a lot of cancers we're concerned about, rightfully so, but thyroid cancer is actually the fastest increasing type of cancer among women in North America today. So yeah, that's just one, one big example. And it's, more common among women than men. Why do you think that is? Yeah, there's, there's three different theories, and this is true for autoimmune disease in general. You know, your thyroid, when it's not working right, it's because your immune system is mistreating it. I think about, you imagine like a home security guard, and uh, in a perfect scenario, this guard would like shoot the bad guy trying to break into your house. So imagine this guard is just, I don't know, doing double duty or, or you know, doing Red Bull to stay awake all day and and the dark guard hears your dog and freaks out and shoots at your dog. So that, that's autoimmunity. Your immune system attacks a delicate, important thing that's supposed to be inside of you and it's safe. And that can be triggering all those different diseases of underactive thyroid, overactive or thyroid cancer. And you're right, it's more common among women than men. The, the rates vary you hear about like six to one, eight to one, but it's definitely more common. So the theories behind that, some think that there's some distinct immune response in women related to pregnancy. So microscopic leftover embryonic fetal cells may somehow trigger an immune response. And that's one. The other thought is that just the whole hormonal difference. So the estrogenic androgenic ratios among women to men, that, that allows women to have a higher rate of autoimmunity as well. Then the last theory is that we think that the genes that trigger most thyroid disease are X-linked genes. And so women have two sets of those. You know, a small little clinical pro for the listeners. Because of that, when there's a direct male relative that has thyroid disease, so for example, like, like my daughter, uh, let's, let's say I had thyroid disease. I actually don't, but if I did, I've got an X and a Y chromosome. My daughter has two Xs. So my daughter got one X from my wife and one X from myself. So I only had one X to give. So if I've got something goofy on my X chromosome, she got it. <laughs> if, if my wife had it, she may or may not have. You know, there's a risk, but not as definitive. But for those of you out there, if you've ever have a, a father uh, that has thyroid disease or, or men, if you've got a daughter that, that doesn't, and you do, the odds are just so high in those cases. So yeah, the excellent chromosome factors we think is the third main theory why women get more autoimmunity in general. Well, I think also one of the areas coming up is the increasing incidence, right? Because those would be standard over time, but yet now we're seeing an increase of thyroid disease and thyroid nodules. Yeah. Why are we experiencing such a, you know, really a rapid increase over the last two, three decades? It's been upwards of a threefold increase. And the, the first thought is always, well, are we just diagnosing it better? But the data is pretty strong that no, it's not that. It's more real cases. So your thyroid, it's... <laughs> Uh, you ever see the show, shows about the hoarders, those that just like store things and can't let go of them? I don't watch TV, but I've heard they had, I've known people that have been like that, but your thyroid is a hoarder. So <laughs> it does that for iodine. And that's actually good because the amount that it needs is more than you would find in your bloodstream. So it holds it and holds onto it and concentrates it. 
But the drawback is there's a lot of chemicals that are really bad for your thyroid that kind of look like iodine to that thing that concentrates it. So your thyroid pulls in more chemicals even than your liver might or your bloodstream might have or the fat or the brain. And then those chemicals can lurk for decades and silently create inflammation, which can eventually start that whole autoimmune cascade. But it takes, it takes some time for that to all play out, typically at least, at least three decades or more. So right now we're seeing more people that have had time since the, the 70s, 80s, 90s to really just brew all of these chemicals inside the thyroid and trigger the disease to come on. So for example, like the tragic nuclear power reaction in Fukushima, everyone knows that that will not do anything next year, but everyone knows that in 20 years, the rates of thyroid cancer in those areas will, be, will just skyrocket. So thyroid disease, it's, it's a bit of a time bomb and whatever triggers it is always something that, was, that goes back several decades. Well, that relating to radionuclear exposure is due to the competing radionucleotides to iodine, mm -hmm. plus yeah. the toxin so, exposure, immune exposure, inflammation, are, you know, reactive oxidative species. Totally. So we think there's some combination of the genes being susceptible, icky stuff getting stuck in the thyroid, and then a large bucket of possible immune stressors. That's like the simplest way to think of all of it. And yeah, you mentioned a lot of those good immune stressors. Um, and, and we know that uh, perchlorate is a big chemical. Uh, fluoride can be a factor. Lead, cadmium, um, Teflon from pans. One paradox is that iodine actually goes both ways. It can be a nutrient or a toxin for the thyroid. It's actually the most documented toxin. But that's, that's the big picture. There's more of it. And it's a real thing that triggers serious disease. I think that's so fascinating because you said, you know, iodine can go both ways for the thyroid. It can be toxic or it can be restorative, right? It can be, I mean, yeah. necessary part of the function, but it's, it changes based on the environment the thyroid is in, right? Mm -hmm. So like that high stress, high cortisol, we create kind of just like, you know, whenever I talk about high cortisol, I say, you know, the essence of all disease is the leaky membrane, right? And cortisol <laughs> yeah. will open those doors to a leaky membrane, whether it's in the gut, the brain, the heart, the endothelium. I mean, you know, and so with the, I'm curious if um, elevated cortisol is going to increase the propensity to thyroid disease as well. You couldn't be more right. And, and even further along those lines, elevated, but also just abnormal cortisol, so that, that last bucket of immune stressors, there's this cortisol wave. I mean, we need to have some to wake us up. I call it our internal coffee machine, you know, and then we've got to shut it off to go to sleep. And when that wave is healthy, you, you described it beautifully. Your cells open up like they should, and they take in hormones properly. And the mitochondria do that as well. But when that wave is off, if it's, if it's like always high or if it's always low or if it's like hitting at the wrong times, any of those things can make it to where – the body is not going to respond right. We're going to have more just unmanaged inflammation and more immune abnormalities. And modern life is like the perfect storm to screw up our adrenals. So <laughs> it's very relevant. Right, right. And that goes into the entire feedback system with the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal thyroid axis, gonadal axis, add that combination in there. So at different times of, of life, we'll be having different stressors to you know, certainly the thyroid, let alone the adrenals. And I want to talk about that combination. Before I do, I do want to talk about the increase in thyroid nodules. And maybe we yeah. can uh, show people how to do their own little thyroid exam. I trained mm -hmm. at, um, I did my endocrinology rotation at Cook County in Chicago with thyroid, a thyroid specialist. So I remember quantifying the thyroid gland in grams and then seeing massive, <laughs> abnormal crazy things with the thyroid but women over the last few decades we've been exposed to hundreds of more chemicals just through makeup and i think makeup skin care all the chemicals in our shampoo could be very toxic to our thyroid what evidence is there to you know draw that um conclusion there's there's very strong evidence there's data linking my last count that i took on this is a little dated it's probably about a year and a half old but the last count I took, there was over 312 environmental chemicals that have been documented to be triggers of thyroid disease. And you're exactly right. Many of them are found in our cosmetics and our topical products. You know, as, as inadequate as our labeling of food is, um, it's even worse for cosmetics. There's really no detailed labeling about 
what's there are some ingredients listed but but by there no means by no means are they exhaustive so there's many ingredients that are bad enough that are on the label but there's many that are not on the label and what you're putting on you you are eating you know it is going inside of you and you're right they they do bioaccumulate and they are things that are known to be triggers of thyroid disease so you talked about the nodules they they are more prevalent and thyroid cancer is definitely on the rise uh, and self exams are important. Uh, I just saw a gentleman actually this yesterday who had thyroid cancer at a very young age, and not as common for men, but it does happen. And he first picked it up by just shaving, noticing an odd texture difference. So being aware of your body is critical. We hear about breast exams, you know, testicular exams for men. Do them, but then also check your neck. <laughs> now, the trick with that is you want to get. You want to get a glass of water, and you want to have a little handheld mirror. That's that's the setup. So I'm getting getting my props together here. Perfect. Pardon me. <laughs> so here's a little notebook. So this is my this is my handheld mirror. So first, you want to just take a look in the mirror, and you're looking. So here's the Adam's apple. It's more pronounced on me than it is on my lovely guests, or not. I'm the guest, but <laughs> my my <laughs> lovely interview here. So more pronounced on men, but Right around this and below that is where the thyroid would be. There's two muscles um, that are called the sternocleidomastoids that are on the side of the neck. They're rather prominent. So it's right within that. And a healthy thyroid shouldn't be obviously felt. You really shouldn't feel anything is, yeah. is what you should be expecting. So you want to first just look, get familiar with this whole neighborhood, and, and then also just palpate. Uh, dominant hand, fingertips are often best. And have a little system by which you go through like, like grids. You start on one side and work across and go all the way down. And then overlap a bit as you switch over and get the other side and all the way down back to that muscle border. Uh, get a sense of what normalcy feels like. Now, as you do this, it's very expected that you don't know what normal is. So don't be at all alarmed or concerned if you feel a need to reach out to your doctor and say, hey, what about this? And it's probably going to be fine. And that's okay. You know, just have them get some reassurance and Get to know what normal is for your anatomy. So first off, you're looking and feeling, and you're using, using the mirror. The next part about this is just, just drinking some water. And the idea is you're going to swallow, and you're going to push this out, and it's going to protrude further. So here we are, we're looking in the mirror. I just poured water all over myself. <laughs> I know, but I have a mouthful. It almost came out. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you licensed for baptism? <laughs> I know. In the name of the Father. I'm hysterical, Alan. <laughs> it was ice water, water too. All over <laughs> yourself. Yeah, so you don't have to do that every month. <laughs> this is called the thyroid water challenge. <laughs> but as you're drinking, you want to watch. If there is something that's odd, that's really going to make it flare. It's really going to show up and you'll catch it. So yeah, get in the habit of the thyroid check. And just a little, you know, caveat is don't examine both sides at the same time, right? Don't put both mm -hmm. hands because you can, const you know, you can compress the arteries there, on, you know, bilaterally, and that can cause a little syncopal event. We don't want that. That's always that <laughs> little <laughs> clinical pearl when you're in a hurry, you know, like, let's just do double hand exam on the thyroid and you totally forget. But um, <laughs> but choose, you know, do one side at a time. And, and for our listeners, the more you, just like your breast exam, is that the more you examine yourself, the more your fingers will have memory. You'll have digital memory. And you'll mm -hmm. feel all of a sudden, okay, you know what? That feels a little off. I don't feel that. Let me just check again in a couple of days and see, is there, you know, is there something there or not? But it's surprising how, you know, because it comes on gradually. Like what Alan said is you don't really want to be able to um, identify a bulging thyroid gland. But what I've seen in practice sometimes are people who have come in and their thyroid gland is the size of, you know, I mean, a tennis ball at this point. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. I've not noticed that. It's important to look and look at pictures when you were younger and look at your neck. You know, is there... Is there a shift? So refer back to some earlier pictures and see, and even take a picture now, you know, so you get a good reference to, okay, well, what does your neck look like? And how does, you know, how does that look? Do I need Botox, Alan? 
my neck. <laughs> you look <laughs> <as> <laughs> beautiful as always. <laughs> like while we're looking, you know? No. <laughs> okay. So perfect. So we've learned how to diagnose the thyroid. Now let's talk about testing the thyroid. What if someone says, you know what, I'm not sure I'm feeling the symptoms of thyroid disease that you see most commonly in your practice. And what's your clinical workup? And I know that you've got um, a program on um, supporting the thyroid. So I want you to talk a little bit about that too and how people can get more information to healing their own thyroid because you know so much of what we can do is within our own hands versus in our clinical hands. But let's talk a little bit about the clinical workup and testing. For sure. So yeah, so symptoms that are suspicious, uh, any, any possible symptoms, you'd be amazed. There's so many possible symptoms. Some of the highest predictable symptoms that have the most statistical relevance include things that have shifted over a certain time frame. So some symptoms you may have had always, and that they could be relevant, but the ones that really are likely are the ones that you could say, yeah, this changed six months ago, or this all went downhill last year. Like there's some time frame where it was different. Um, hoarseness, uh, unexplained coldness, fatigue that you wouldn't predict. You, know, you didn't run a marathon, but you felt like you did. Uh, abnormal muscle pain, depression for no clear reason, unexplained weight gain. So you're, you're doing what you've done that has worked before for your weight, but it's not working now. And then also unexplained hair thinning. Those are some of the real big ones. And then, and then work up. So there's a couple of facets, one of which is testing thoroughly, and then one of which is reading deeply into the tests. So a good workup will involve testing the thyroid's performance, how your brain talks to your thyroid, your thyroid's inflammation, and then also any thyroid autoimmunity. And the tricky part is that the disease usually starts, as I mentioned, from autoimmunity, and that can go on for even a decade before the thyroid's performance is clearly altered. So it's important to check that part. And in terms of tactics, that means thyroid antibodies. Now, the drawback is thyroid antibodies are negative in 40% or more of those that have Hashimoto's. So they're very valuable when they show up. They are definitively saying, yes, the person has Hashimoto's. When they're not present, that does not mean that it's not there. <laughs> so okay. think about this. Like, that. Uh, yeah, explain that a little bit more. Then how do we know they have Hashimoto's? Sure. So I also do love ultrasound evaluation when someone is, has symptoms and they want to be good, get good clarity on whether the thyroid's functioning well, to also know about, you mentioned the size, you know, the size, the structure, the properties of the thyroid. Sometimes that's the main way that it's found out. The only definitive way is to know if someone has it for certain is through biopsy, but we never do that for screening. So ultrasound is a great screening tool along with thorough blood tests. And it's also important for the concerns you voiced about the nodules and the concerns we discussed about thyroid cancer. That's a great way to know if someone does have risks that way. Mm, yeah. Okay. And so when you're looking at thyroid antibodies, we're looking at thyroid peroxidase antibodies and antithyroglobulin antibodies. And also thyroid, thyroid simulating immunoglobulin. And then also just thyroglobulin. So we've got plain thyroglobulin as a marker of thyroid inflammation and antithyroglobulin is one of the markers of thyroid autoimmunity. So when you're drawing thyroid labs, what are all the labs you're drawing? Uh, High-sensitive TSH, free T3, free T4, reverse T3, antithyroglobulin, antithyroid peroxidase, thyroid-stimulating immunoglobulin, and then thyroglobulin. Okay. I haven't checked thyroid-stimulating immunoglobulin. It's most relevant for Graves, but I do pick up on some people that have Graves plus Hashimoto's and some that have the Graves antibody but it's actually leading to more of a hypothyroid state or they're not yet symptomatic from it. So it's a, it's a preclinical Graves. Okay. So tell us what is Graves disease and what is Hashimoto's disease? You know, I, Hashimoto's disease, I have no, I have no qualm with the name. Uh, Dr. Hashimoto, wonderful researcher, great work. 1907, he figured out that our thyroid slows down mostly because we attack it. Graves disease, uh, Dr. Robert Grave, also a good researcher. I hate the fact that we use his name because <laughs> it's, it's scary. You know, it is it's scary, you know, right? Like you know, and, and no, that's not why we call it Graves disease. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's something that's significant, but no. So Hashimoto's is where you're breaking down the parts of your thyroid that make hormone. Now, Graves disease, imagine you've got a doorbell 
and your brain hits the doorbell and your thyroid says, oh, I'm going to put some hormone out there. So it opens the door and releases hormone. So in Graves' disease, there's a short circuit in the doorbell. So you're not hitting the doorbell, but the thyroid thinks that you are. So it's putting out all this hormone when you don't need it to. So that's Graves' disease. And the odd thing is, even though in most cases the consequences are opposite, you know, one is overactive, one is under, the underlying issues that give rise to them are the exact same thing. It's like the exact same triggers. It's almost the exact same disease process, but it's just whether you're attacking the stuff inside the thyroid or the doorbell on the outside of the thyroid is the only difference about it. Mm, that's a really good way to put it because you think of it, you know, one is putting on the accelerator, one's putting on the brake is the way I've already, uh, you know, I'd thought about it, but just the fact that both is represents the thyroid under attack, right? Yeah. The thyroid under attack. And so typically the we see when... Tiniest, tiniest molecule difference between the two as far as which, which protein they're attacking. That's amazing. That's pretty cool. And, um, and so excellent. So tell us about World Thyroid Day and how people can follow up with you. <laughs> so yeah, come hang out, World Thyroid Day. This is the eighth annual, and I've been active with this ever since the first one started. Um, and May 25th, it's a time to really think about your thyroid. <laughs> I'm hosting a free event, and we'll talk more in depth about just how it can affect your health in big ways. And again, it's more than just the, all the ways you know about are significant, but there are a lot of just health risks and complications that we don't think about, uh, many big diseases that are associated with that. And I'd love to get more awareness out there. So yeah, come hang out, tell your friends about this, so that they can be safer as well and tell the loved ones. And I just want there to be more awareness and more understanding about what a real thing this is for our health. Mm, yeah, beautiful. Okay, and so then they can find you at drallenchristensen.com. Um, yeah, drchristensen, drchristensen.com. Honestly, if you just Google my name, Alan Christensen, I, I show up pretty easily. Yeah. Okay. Nothing you have to remember. <laughs> now, what are some, what can our listeners do if they're struggling with Hashimoto's? What are some of the first steps that they need to take that they may not have been told to take in their clinical um, encounter? You know, for Hashimoto's, for managing it well, there's two sides to it. There's, um, there's getting the right amount of thyroid hormone your body needs, and there's managing the immune process. They're, they're two things that have some overlap. So for many the gland is making too little hormone. And that has consequences. That's where many of the symptoms emerge from. Some of the symptoms actually come from the autoimmunity. And that can be involved with the hair loss, with some of the connective tissue issues like joint, tendon, ligament pain. And then also some of the mood symptoms can be more so from the autoimmune side. So they're, they're both important. Those to whom the thyroid has slowed past a certain point, most would argue a TSH greater than about two and a half, they're facing medical risks from that level of the thyroid being underactive. So some version of thyroid support, natural thyroid replacement, can be appropriate to move them out of that low hypothyroid state. That itself actually can help the autoimmunity. So when you're not just yelling and desperate for your thyroid to work, that gives your thyroid a little chance to relax and heal, and it can take some of the edge off the immune system response. So that's often one of the first steps and it's really one of the easiest steps. It's nothing that requires the heroic efforts. It's just getting those numbers right with some gentle thyroid replacement. Then we think about the immune part. And there's, there's many, many big things that go on. Probably the two most meaningful tactical steps would be getting, getting iodine right. You know, not, not too much, not too little. And it's really more about not getting too much for those that have Hashimoto's. And especially those who are on thyroid treatment. Because thyroid treatment has a lot of iodine. And in many cases, when you're on a thyroid medication, it has you close to the upper healthy limit of iodine already. So the trick from there is just minimizing any extra external sources. And then past that, we think a lot about just really maximizing good digestive function. So being off of foods that are obvious thyroid triggers, we think about like, like soy and also gluten, gluten extracts, and, and then also foods that are personal triggers for you, and really knowing which foods maybe triggering an immune response for yourself. So yeah, those are your top, top three action steps. Mm, that's very good. Now, how are you testing for food um, uh, sensitivities now? Yeah, I'll do common screens for celiac, and I'll do those annually. There's been data arguing that some just don't show positive, all, you know, even when they should. And I'll also do food intolerance studies. 
Uh, you're, you're a great clinician. You've worked with a lot of different laboratories. Some are better than others, and I'm sure you, you'll be giving your listeners some feedback on your advice that way. So listen to Dr. Quebec, uh, use a laboratory that is accurate and is meaningful. Some, some are great, some are questionable. Uh, some pitfalls about testing include the fact that if there's foods you've already been not eating for a long time, they may not show up even for right. culprits. And that's okay, just know that. Just don't expect that. It doesn't mean that you didn't need to avoid them. <laughs> it's just validation on the whole process. Like if someone has even the worst peanut allergy, they don't eat peanuts very often and they won't have peanuts show up on their score. So just know that part. The big value of testing is to know which foods that may not be obviously affecting you on a day-to-day basis are still affecting you. So yeah, so, so testing is helpful. And then I'm actually, I'm, well, ahead. I was going to say, I actually have mixed feelings about avoidance and reintroduction diets. So a pitfall that some fall into is that if you cut out a lot of foods from your diet and then you add in high amounts of that food, it may feel awful, not because it was bad, just because you're not used to it. <laughs> And some people get like boxed into a corner of like no more foods because they've cut out so much, they can't tolerate anything. So it's nice to be selective and targeted and not, not overdo it. Right. But often it's the food that um, you say, I'm going to take this away. And you're like totally claw on to that food. You're like, <laughs> but not that, one. <laughs> Just not that one. You can take <laughs> everything else, but not my cheese. Just I've fought cheese. with that <laughs> for years. For years, I was like, okay, you know, I'm just eliminating it now, but it's not too bad, right? But, you know, when it, and it's like I still keep trying to reintroduce it. It's just, you know, one of these days. But Sometimes um, that's the only test you need. <laughs> exactly. Sometimes that, that's it. And, again, I'm all about balance, right? We have to have balance. Some, some of us have gotten so restrictive in what they allow themselves that, it, you know, it does restrict your tolerance, your body's ability to tolerate. So just reintroduction mm. at small amount. We know that, you know, if our body's not reacting to it in an autoimmune way, right, um, then, you know, be judicious in our exposure to it. So I think that's really important. I love the work you're doing on thyroid health, Alan, and that your focus and that you've helped so many people with all this, and you're always generous giving your information out. So for all our listeners, check out drchristensen.com and um, show up to his the World Thyroid Day party that he's having, his virtual party. <laughs> <laughs> so I look forward to being there myself. Thank you, Alan. Awesome. Take great care, Hannah.